Tom McCall died at Good Samaritan Hospital and Medical Center at 7.50 a.m. McCall had fought the battle against cancer for a decade. He was stricken with prostate cancer in 1973. It reappeared in 1981. Then last August, while hospitalized for an ear infection, tests revealed the cancer had spread to his spine and base of his skull. The news hit McCall hard, but he never lost his sense of humor. Somebody asked me how I, how I would uh, sum up everything that I'd experienced at this stay in the hospital. And I said, looking at all the charts and listening to the doctors, I sensed that uh, I'm headed for Valhalla like a bat out of hell. December 13th, McCall entered Good Samaritan for the last time. Life support systems were not used to prolong his life out of respect for Governor McCall's request that he be allowed to die naturally. I just bolted out of bed and looked outside and there was this beautiful mist covering the sun and there, were, there was a rainbow and a break in the clouds and I had this feeling that Dad had, had passed away. Sam McCall says his father asked to have his food tube removed uh, yesterday. In his words, now, his dad was tired of fighting. Just... Governor Atia was among those who stopped by the McCall home today to pay his respects. He said McCall's death is a personal loss, that the voice of a great champion of our state is stilled, but not forgotten. Tom McCall is going to live really in so many of us, uh, in the sense that he uh, had such strong feelings that we must emulate. So many other people are going to uh, be speaking uh, for the thoughts that Tom has. He's left us a legacy that's, that's still living and that will continue to in Oregon's history. He loved Oregon more than anything. But I consider him, I consider myself very fortunate to have had him for 43 years. But it wasn't long enough. I'm Sandy James reporting for Newsroom 6. Yes, it is. Yeah, we're really uh, excited about this. How did you get into the outdoor school? Well, I got into it about five years ago just by joining the Multnomah County. Uh, yeah, but how did they get into it? Sure. Uh, we're going to join. Now, this activist. This may sound corny, but this activist loves Oregon more than life. He can't have both very long, but the trade-off, the trade-off with me is perfectly okay. But if the legacy we have helped give Oregon, and which made it twinkle afar, well, if it goes, I guess I wouldn't, wouldn't want to live in Oregon anyhow. Yes, sir. You're looking for a celebrity. You've got to keep going to keep doing. Or you've got to keep doing to keep going, probably the way to put it. And that's why it's not selfishly that I take these causes up, because I always did. It's not a panacea. It's not a counter-irritant to my pain with cancer. It, it just, I just feel that I don't have the time to stick around and give everybody hell for doing the wrong thing. I've got to do all I can right now, you see. We knew him first as a television reporter and last as a television commentator. But what we know him best for and what he loved best were his eight years as governor of Oregon. It'll, the governorship? Yes. It'll always be the, the most fun, the greatest challenge, the greatest worry, and the highest call to duty that I'll ever have. Or if I lived to be a thousand, there couldn't be anything that would be more rewarding and more important, and in which I felt I was making a major contribution to the state I love. He was a hell of a man, taking a stand when something needed done. He was one politician who could make a decision, that's why he's our favorite son. From Astoria to Newport, and up to Multnomah Falls, from 66 to 74, our governor was Tom McCall. 
Tom McCall was not the first governor in his family. His grandfather, Samuel Walker McCall, was governor of Massachusetts. But his parents, Hal and Dorothy, left their comfortable, wealthy existence in Boston to take a chance on the West. They settled here on this ranch near Prineville, built a home and a family. The influence of Dorothy Lawson McCall on her children was unquestioned. She was a woman who never forgot her New England heritage, yet never retreated back to it, even when times got tough. Never. Never. I, I, just, I just decided that we came to do it ourselves. That's why we came, we're New England people. And when we came out to do a thing, we would do it if we died doing it. Setting out to do something, then doing it. A simple thing to say, a harder thing to accomplish. It was a lesson Dorothy Lawson McCall's second-born son never forgot. A few weeks ago, I said the overriding challenge the umbrella issue of the campaign and of the decade in Oregon is quality, quality of life in Oregon. I respectfully suggest to you that the proposals this administration has submitted to you today will meet that challenge and will further dramatize the significance of that issue. Like many of the hallmarks of McCall's tenure in office, environmental concern did not begin with Tom McCall. Livability, that was Mark Hatfield's word. The Willamette Greenway and the effort to save the beaches, those were Bob Straub's ideas. The Bottle Bill and Oregon's Pioneer Land Use Planning Bill, those began with legislators. But it was Tom McCall who loaned those ideas, the force of his personality, his considerable verbal skills, and not least of all, his wit. Some highway engineers have a mentality, engineeringly speaking, that would run an eight-lane freeway through the Taj Mahal. That is our problem. Of all the quotable things uttered by Tom McCall, none was quoted more than the statement he made to a national JCS convention in Portland in 1971. Visit Oregon, he said, but for heaven's sake, don't move here to live. To this day, that statement provokes controversy. Some say it is still scaring businesses away from Oregon. But Tom McCall was proud of that statement. That was the most profound statement I ever made, or ever will make. Uh, that uh, visit uh, all you want to, but please don't move here to live. For heaven's sake, don't move here to live, because that was the first time a government official at that level of uh, visibility and authority ever dared even say tongue-in-cheek such a thing, because it was uh, conflicting with the image of hospitality a governor is supposed to have, and uh, Western hospitality is equated with God and motherhood. But it started a lot of people thinking about growth. He was a governor who thrived on crisis. No blue ribbon committees or emergency task forces for Tom McCall. In 1970, to head off an expected confrontation between American legionnaires meeting in Portland and anti-war demonstrators, he sponsored a week-long concert in McIver Park called Vortex. In 1973, he met a shortage of hydropower by turning off the switch on outdoor lighting. And in 1974, he met a gasoline shortage by implementing the odd-even plan, which quickly became a model for the rest of the nation. Gasoline was getting short. The Arabs closed the pumps. Well, the oil companies thought a while and prices started to jump. Gas lines started growing. To the pumps, the cars did crawl. Well, I can get that gas a-flowing, said Governor Tom McCall. Green means they got gas, red means they're out, and yellow means we'll see. All the even days tell you when you can buy, it's as simple as can be. Hallelujah, said the people, from Georgia to Utah. You know, wish we had a governor as smart as Tom McCall. McCall's talent for grabbing state and national headlines sometimes backfired on him. When he shut down the Boise Cascade plant in Salem because of excessive air pollution, angry workers accused him of doing it for the publicity value. Oh, I missed you. I get so much publicity. I'm sick of it. As practiced and polished as McCall was at courting the press, he never really liked courting voters. It was one of the reasons he never ran for the United States Senate, and he never explained it more clearly than the first time he declined to run in 1967 against Wayne Morse. Even though I like people immensely, and so does my wife, and we visit around the state as much as we can, we rather serve, we prefer to serve, 
to campaigning. Campaigning is an exhaustive, hectic way to meet people. We like the opportunity of uh, visiting with them as governor, rather than as a campaigner who's uh, out seeking political favor. McCall's discomfort showed in 1978 when four years out of office, he decided against the advice of most of his associates to try for another term as governor. How do you do, James? Tom McCall, glad to meet you. You gonna be, you gonna be the next governor? Well, we're striving in that direction. Uh -huh. But in his four years away from the Capitol, McCall had missed a change in the direction of his own party. On primary night, it was Vicatia whom Republicans chose to be their standard bearer. It was a defeat McCall had not expected, and even long after the polls had revealed his fate, was not prepared to accept. I ran the campaign as well as I could, and I did yeah, not, yeah. as you know, never take any shots. Well, we ran the thing. We ran as all the little mind feels that you and Roger laid that I was a preacher of the 1960s, you know, that I was an I-5 candidate. Oh, yes. I didn't. No, well, that's okay. There's no use bickering. You apparently have a sufficient number of votes to win the Republican primary. How many? Which is about 8% of the votes in the state of Oregon. Good luck to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. That was the end of Tom McCall's political career, but almost a year later, May 4, 1979, he retaliated by depriving the Oregon Republican Party of one of its great legends. That was the day he and his wife, Audrey, registered as independents. But even when he returned to being reporter Tom McCall, no one forgot Governor McCall, least of all Governor Atia. Well, Governor, let me put my news hat on and ask you about the Oregonian's idea <laughs> for a surcharge, in effect, on the income tax, a duration of no more than, than two years, rather than putting those cuts on the agencies, because just as you indicated, you said they're going to have to take it, but that doesn't mean they can take it, and I think you agree with me. Yeah. It was almost impossible for anyone not to be overshadowed by Tom McCall, but Atia seemed to get more than his share of McCall's shade. In one of his last public appearances, McCall traveled to the Oregon-California border to help Atia remove the We Hope You Enjoy Your Visit portion of the Welcome to Oregon sign. The event was supposed to signal the death knell of McCall's Visit But Don't Stay philosophy. It was to be McCall's final capitulation to a state that now courts the attentions of out-of-state businesses. But McCall refused to follow the script. As he had demonstrated time and again during his eight years as governor, he was unwilling to surrender an idea he believed in and the state he loved. I'm simply saying that Oregon is demure and lovely, and it ought to play a little hard to get. And I think you'll all be just as sick as I am if we find it is nothing but a hungry hussy throwing herself at every stinking smokestack that's offered. There was good years and some bad ones, and some we won't recall. But I say out loud, we was mighty proud of Governor Tom McCall. From Astoria to Newport, and up to Multnomah Falls. From 66 to 74, our governor was Tom McCall.